All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, I think I may be fibbing a little bit on the initial slide because I'm saying the attendance grades are up today. I think I'm one lecture behind. Um, one thing I will uh, just reiterate, if, uh, if you're going to uh, miss class or whatnot, do me a favor and, and let me know in advance. It makes it a little easier with the, uh, the attendance and whatnot. Um, I'm usually pretty uh, easygoing and whatnot. Just make sure and let me know in advance. Um, all the homework is graded uh, and up to date. As for the exam, uh, I have not yet gotten that graded. There's 52 people in here, and so that's, that's going to take a little bit. And on top of that, you're, I had another exam in another class. I, I had originally scheduled those to be on separate weeks, so I'd have time to chip away at them, and then the weather happened. So I, I suddenly found myself with about 80 exams on my desk, so I've got to slowly chip away at those. So my goal is either Thursday or next Tuesday to have that graded. Um, I'd rather take my time with that to do that right. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, I've had me for class before. You know, I'm, I'm usually uh, pretty reasonable in terms of partial credit, but the flip side is that it takes a while to grade, so I've, I've got to do that uh, appropriately. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to assign uh, 4.1 today. Um, as you know, we're behind a lecture in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, because of the weather, um, but what I decided to do is um, the vast majority of you had me for statics, and so um, you know I, I am much more acutely aware of what we covered in there, and I know that uh, we spent a fair amount of time in there discussing centroids. Um, one thing that we did not discuss in very great detail, and it was especially near the end of the semester, is the computation of a moment of inertia. And we did it, but we, it was only like one lecture, and, and, and I think it's, it's definitely worth reviewing in here, especially because of our next big topic in the class, which is bending. So, the way that bending works is um, bending is basically a combination of a bunch of other many topics from static. So it requires you to understand how to compute a centroid. It requires you to understand what a moment of inertia is and how to compute it. It also requires you to be able to construct a shear and moment diagram. So what we're going to do today and Thursday is we're going to sort of recap that stuff from static. So if you look on Blackboard, it says topic four is like a refresher from statics. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, shouldn't you have done that at the beginning of the semester? Well, the stuff that we've been using up until now from statics has been pretty basic. This is the stuff that I think is, I don't want to say advanced from statics, but it's, it's a little bit more involved. And, and it's, we, we need to be much more uh, familiar with how to do that stuff now. So that's what we're going to focus on uh, today. Uh, is uh, geometric properties, uh, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why uh, here in a little bit. Um, well, actually, uh, let, let's talk about that now. How many of you remember me showing you these four formulas near the beginning of the semester? I said that these are sort of the big four stress formulas, if you will, that we are going to be uh, utilizing this semester. Okay. Now, two of those are boxed, Okay. Um, and two of those are boxed because we've already dealt with them. We have dealt with the computation of axial stresses, um, and we have dealt with the computation of uh, shear stresses due to torsion, okay? And both of those formulas, and I want to focus on the ones that are boxed because I think they're kind of important, both of those formulas are really a function of two classes of information. The first is applied uh, or, or, or uh, a supported internal load, I should say. So we apply load to a system, what's the internal response? So, for example, for axial stresses, we need the applied load or the supported load P, or we need the internal torque T for torsional stresses. But then the other class of information we need are what are called section properties. Now, section properties, are, are that's just a, a fancy term for a numerical value that characterizes a cross-section. And up until now, we've already been using some section properties, and you had exposure to section properties even before you became an engineering student. You maybe just didn't refer to them as section properties. Here's an example. If I have a circle, okay, what are some section properties of that circle? Well, the area, that is a number which classifies that circle, right? If I give you a circle and tell you its area, that gives you some proportion about that section. I could tell you its circumference. I could also tell you the location of the centroid, you know, and so on and so forth. These are all section properties, right? Okay. So I, I want to go through those section properties or those geometric properties 
uh, in a little bit more detail today, focusing on the ones that we hear about in engineering, because of what you see in the remaining two stress formulas. Okay? And what common section property do you see in our remaining two stress formulas? The moment of inertia. Okay? The moment of inertia is incredibly important towards understanding and classifying flexural response. I take a beam, I bend it. I, um, from statics, we know that if I have a beam and I subject it to external load, that I'm going to develop both internal shears and internal moments. Um, based on those internal shears and moments, as well as section properties like the moment of inertia, we can determine the internal stresses. And by now, we should know that those stresses are critical and understanding whether or not the beam is safe or it's uh, functioning according to prescribed uh, parameters and whatnot. Now, our first uh, stress formula that we are going to be dealing with is this formula here, sigma equals my over i. This is by and large one of the most famous and fundamental equations in all of engineering. And this will tell you the stress in a cross-section that's being bent. And it is a function of three parameters. It is a function of the, moment, uh, the applied or the resisting moment the moment inside the beam, but it is also a function of the moment of inertia and this term y. y is the distance from the point in question to a particular location in the cross-section. And what is that location? The centroid. Okay? So centroids and moments of inertia are going to be very critical. One of the things that we're going to learn with bending stress is that when you bend an element, it receives zero deformation or experiences zero deformation along the centroid. So if I have a beam I take that beam and I bend it. The idea is that along the centroid, it doesn't experience any deformation at all. And then as we move away from the centroid, the stresses and the resulting strains get higher and higher. So, for example, if I look at this beam that's being bent, the highest points of external, or the highest points of bending stress and strain are either at the top or at the bottom. Okay? Does that make sense? So, and, and at the centroid, the resulting stresses are zero. So we need to talk about centroids and moments of inertia again. Let's talk about that. Let's go back to the basics of, com uh, com of computing a centroid and computing a moment of inertia. We're going to start with centroids. Does anybody remember the formula that you use to compute the location of a centroid? There's a basic fundamental formula that you use. The fraction, right? On the top. What's that? Basically a weighted average. That's 100% right. In order to determine, so, so first off, let's go back to basics. What is the difference between a center of gravity and a centroid? A center of gravity will tell you the weighted average, if you will, of a given body in terms of its weight, in terms of the, uh, the, the forces applied to the system. Okay? And that makes sense if you're looking at a, let's say something like a car. Okay, a car has a specific center of gravity. And using the term center of gravity for something like a car makes complete sense because a car is made of multiple materials. It's made of steel, aluminum, rubber, you name it, plastics, you name it. And so using the term centroid really wouldn't make a lot of sense because there are different components uh, uh, composed of different constitutive materials. However, in this course, what we're interested in is, okay, let's say you were designing a car, okay? Now, granted, there is the uh, uh, global vision, if you will, of what the, the new Maserati is supposed to look like, but somebody also has to go in and design the individual components of that Maserati, the struts, the frame, and whatever else you mechanical engineers have to do. Forgive me. I'm a civil engineer. I could talk about bridges all day long. That's about the extent of my understanding of how to design a car. Um, but you are going to look at that uh, on a component by component basis. And component by component, you're going to be looking more often than not components that are comprised of a single material. For, uh, and to use an example that's a little more near and dear to my heart, if I was designing, let's say, the frame that supports this building, the frame is probably going to com be comprised of either steel or concrete elements, and those elements are one material or can be treated as one material as opposed to, to several. So when we remove from the problem the parameter of or the, 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 the complexity of multiple materials and look at a single material, we really don't care so much about the center of gravity such that we do uh, the weighted average of an area. 
Okay, so if the center of gravity is a weighted average of just that the weight, the weighted average of the area is the centroid. Okay, so the idea is if I have some shape, some region, that the coordinates of the centroid, not at, uh, x bar comma y bar, that point, is the location about which I can idealize all of those uh, loads as a single force acting at that point. So this is the point, if you will, on the region, or uh, associated with that region, such that all of the forces can be collapsed into that one point and we achieve static equilibrium. Now, the way that we can compute that, we can either use a calculus-based infinitesimal expression or we can use an algebraic expression. And so, from a calculus perspective, what we're doing, let's say for x bar, is we're computing the uh, area and then we're computing the first moment of area. So the area is integrating the function and the first moment is integrating x times the function and then dividing those two we get x bar. That is how we uh, define centroids from an infinitesimal expression. And that's fine if you're dealing with, let's say, a really, really complicated shape or you're trying to derive some basic formulas. More often than not in engineering, we already know what the moment of inertia of a rectangle is or a triangle is, etc. Pop quiz, anybody remember what the, how we compute the moment of inertia of a rectangle? Say it again. No, I'm talking about the moment of inertia, not the centroid. I'm just seeing if anybody remembers. Yeah. B H cubed over. I remember. Well, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. 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 I do not remember any of those. I just looked at the table. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I forgot yeah, I was dealing with engineers, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so how about this? Let's ask a centroid related question. If I'm dealing with a triangle and I'm going from the big end, does anybody remember where the coordinates of the centroid of a triangle are? What's that? A third of each side. There we go, a third of each side, not a half of each side. Well, not, not the hypothesis, the other two. Yeah. Uh, from the right angle. Okay, all right, so whenever we're locating the centroid, what we can do is we can use properties from previously derived shapes, such as rectangles, circles, um, triangles, so on and so forth, because most cross-sections that we deal with are just that. They are uh, essentially um, uh, well-defined shapes. Every now and then, we engineers deal with really funky stuff, and, and we can either derive those we can use software to help compute centroid locations and whatnot. For instance, AutoCAD has some routines that'll do it for us and whatnot. But by and large, this is kind of the idea. Now, the going back to the location of the comp computation of the location of the centroid from a calculus perspective, remember what we're doing is we're taking the first moment of area and dividing it by the area in order to determine the location of the centroid. That's the derivation. And the first moment of area is, is basically uh, uh, looking at, instead of integrating the function, we are integrating the function times a given moment arm, which in this case is x. Okay? Now, if we're talking about the second moment of area, and so this is, gets into a little bit of a calculus definition, so if we're talking about the moment uh, of the area of a function, so integrating a function will yield its area. If we integrate a function times x, that will yield the moment of that function. That's where the, that term comes from. And so if we wanted, we could get kind of crazy. We could say that, all right, what if I wanted the seventh moment of a function? And I would integrate x to the seventh times that function uh, across the given region. But in engineering land, that, I mean, we can get crazy with it, but there's really only two that are useful. Okay? The first moment of area is useful for computing the location of the centroid. The second moment of area is what's called the moment of inertia. Now, Without um, getting too far into the weeds, for now I just want you to trust me when I tell you that moments of inertia have a profound impact on structural response. Basically what a moment of inertia is, in a nutshell, is a numerical measurement of flexural stiffness. The bigger the moment of inertia, um, the more stiffness you have against bending. Okay. So I'll give you a simple example. How many of you have uh, at your house or your parents' house back home have a uh, 
a wooden porch or a wooden deck in the backyard? Or have you ever been in a house that has a wooden porch or a wooden deck? Okay, so there's, you've got the, sort of the, 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 the slats that you stand on that your grill and your patio furniture are standing on. Then under those slats, there are a series of wooden beams that are supporting uh, the weight of the floor system, right? Now, are those wooden beams that are supporting the load, are they up and down like this, or are they sitting flat like that? They're up and down, right? There is a reason for that. If you grab one of those, or you can do this with something as simple as a yardstick. If you took that element and bent it about that stiff direction versus flipping it and bending it this way, you will find that it's flimsier one direction than it is the other, right? I mean, imagine if you had a yardstick, like even something like this. It's really easy to bend this this way, but if I take it and turn it, it's, it's actually kind of tough to bend it the other direction. The reason why is because this shape has a stronger or a larger moment of inertia along this orientation than it does this orientation. We're going to do a problem here in a little bit looking at the moment of inertia of a representative I-beam. And I challenge you to take the problem that we're about to do here in a little bit later on after class and turn it 90 degrees and do the problem again. And you will find a smaller value uh, at the end of the day. We'll discuss why that is later, but for now, I just kind of want you to trust me on it. Now, for simple shapes, we can do this very easily. Okay, So, for example, if we're trying to compute the moment of inertia, let's say, of a rectangle. Okay, Typically, what we're interested in is centroidal moments of inertia. The moment of inertia with respect to the centroidal axes, if you will. So what I would be doing is integrating the moment of inertia. So if I'm interested in the moment of inertia about the x-axis, I integrate y squared dA. Why the difference? Because the distance from the x-axis, so if here's the x-axis and I'm trying to figure out how far away I am from the x-axis, that's, that's why. So that's why the, the letters are, are flipped, if you will. And so basically what this becomes is a pretty basic uh, uh, calc 1 problem. I'm integrating... Uh, the, this region, so I'm integrating y squared times the function that defines this region, which is just the width, from negative h over 2 to h over 2, and when you chug through all the math, you end up getting dh cubed over 12, okay? And so this can be a, a very straightforward formula that we can use to compute the moment of inertia of a given rectangle. And if your cross-section is just that, if it's just a single rectangle or a single circle, then that's fine. More often than not, though, we're dealing with cross-sections like this. That's not one rectangle, but multiple. So we have to figure out the algorithm for dealing with uh, composite shapes, if you will. Now, first thing I do want to mention is your textbook. If you open up to Appendix E, okay, if you open up to Appendix E, you will find the moments of inertia for relatively straightforward cross-section. And, and to be frank, I kind of like this reference a lot better than the reference in our statics textbook. I think it's a little easier to follow. So, for instance, here's a rectangle. If I'm talking about the moment of inertia about the x-axis with respect to the centroid, bh cubed over 12. Same thing we derived here. Okay? And all sorts of formulas have already been derived for very basic cross-sections. Today, that's the only one that we're going to use is bh cubed over 12 as well as what's on your homework assignment. Again, I'm trying to keep it straightforward. We'll ratchet it up in difficulty uh, a little bit later. With me so far? Any questions? Now, this is good, great, grand, and wonderful if all you have is a rectangle, or if all you have is a circular beam, or a pipe beam, or something like that. You can pretty much use a plug and chuck expression like you see here. But more often than not, we don't deal with that. We have channels, and angles, and Y flange I beams and so on and so forth. And so it's not that simple. Um, sometimes what we have to do is we have to compute the moment of inertia of a more complex shape, if you will. And so the way that we do that is we use basically what, what's, we, we use a, a means of shifting the axis. So instead of integrating Y squared dA, what we do is we integrate Y squared plus some shift, if you will. Okay? Uh, and we need to shift this because typically what we're interested in is the moment of inertia with respect to the centroid of the entire composite shape. Now when we carry this out, so what am I doing from here to here? Doing a little bit of foiling, right? Remember first, outside, inside, last, right? And remember the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. So this is just me going from our fundamental definition and splitting it up a little bit. 
what we end up getting is this expression on the bottom. So we get this original moment of inertia down here, this term over here, which is just the area times some distance squared, and then this polyjunct here, which references the centroid. And so if we're interested in computing moments of inertia from the centroid, then we know that this integral here is going to be zero. And so what we end up with is this formula right here, or more accurately for a composite shape, the parallel axis theorem. Y'all remember we, us doing this in statics last semester? So this is when we have a composite shape, and we want to determine the moment of inertia of that composite shape, we end up summing the following. The moment of inertia of each of the individual shapes plus AD squared. And D is the distance from the centroid of each individual shape to the centroid of the whole thing. Okay? Is this, I know it's been a while, but is this sort of bringing it back? Y'all remember this? Hopefully you do. We're, don't worry, we're going we're gonna to get some uh, uh, practice doing this real quick. Okay? But let me see if, if, um, if, if y'all remember this. Remember, we had this column where we did y minus y bar, and I said it didn't matter if you, which order that you subtracted it in. Remember why? Because you're ultimately going to take this term and square it. And so it doesn't matter what order you do the subtraction in. And I think if this is kind of early and your copy hasn't kicked in and whatnot, as we start going through the problem, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I remember this stuff. So I kind of like the example that we're about to do as well because it also forces us to review the computation of a centroid. Okay? So, so yeah. Um, I'm going to move on. Don't worry. We're going to have um, we're going to have a fair amount of practice on this. Um, there's some additional references I want you to be aware of in your textbook, and this one is something I really want you to pay attention to because this one is going to be important in reference to your homework assignment. So this is a reference out of the um, uh, out of the manual or out of the uh, the the, um, the, the, um, the textbook, and this comes from the AISC Steel Construction Manual. So basically, what this is doing is listing a series of uh, uh, properties for what are called rolled wide flange sections. These are basically the I-beams that you would see in buildings and bridges uh, across America. Now, our naming convention for these types of sections is, so for example, if we have a W14 by 53, the W refers to the type of shape that we're dealing with, so we might be dealing with a channel, we would call those C's, we might be dealing with an angle, we call those L shapes. Uh, w shapes refer to wide flange cross section. So it's basically an I beam, but the flanges are kind of wide. Y'all remember the difference between flanges and webs, right? So flanges, if we have an I beam, the top part and the bottom part, those are the flanges. The middle part is what's called the web. Y'all remember that? Hopefully you do. Well, that's it. So hopefully you remember it moving on. Okay, I, I see that. All right. The 14 represents about how deep it is. So if it's a W14 by 53, the 14 is about how deep it is. All the W14 cross sections follow a similar rolling schedule. So like, for instance, if you look at all the W14s, like one of them is 13.9, one of them is 14.3. They're not exactly 14, but they're pretty close. The 53 refers to how heavy it is. So a W14 by 53 is about 14 inches deep, and it weighs... 53 pounds per foot, okay? So for each of these given cross-sections, you find a series of properties. For instance, you find, for instance, the 14 fit by 53. I know it has an area of 15.6 square inches, so if I wanted to determine axial stress, sigma equals P over A, just whatever that P is divided by 15.6 square inches. I know how deep it is. I know the web thickness. I know the flange properties, the flange is 8.06 inches wide, and its thickness is about 0 0.66 inches. Now, what I kind of want you to pay attention to for the purposes of your homework is what's going on over here, this axis 1,1 one, one, and this axis 2,2. Two, two. So what those refer to are what are called strong axis and weak axis properties. So if you ever hear, you hear me use that term strong axis and weak axis, that's what I'm talking about. The reason I'm able to use that is because, for instance, if you look at the W14 by 53, the moment of inertia about axis 1, 1 is bigger than the moment of inertia about axis 2, 2. It's akin to what I was talking about with the, um, uh, the, the support beams in your porch. There is a reason they are facing upright as opposed to this way, and that's because the moment of inertia about that horizontal axis is larger than the moment of inertia about the vertical axis. That's why we face those 
I support beams in that fashion. And that's what these moments of inertia are. The other two properties, the S values and the R values, we'll talk about those later. They are incredibly easy to compute. The tough one is the I value. If you understand how to compute the I value, you're, you're, you're rocking and rolling. The um, one thing I'll mention, so your homework assignment, I'm actually going to force you to do the math to compute one of these moments of inertia. And you are going to get close. You're not going to get exact. You're going to get close because we're going to ignore these little rounded fillets right here. So where the flange and the web come together, there's a little bit of like a, a rounded fillet area. We're going to ignore that. So your answer is going to be a little lower. Not much, just a little bit. Okay. But the idea is for you to kind of understand the process. Sound good? I thought I'd also throw the properties for structural lumber. Hopefully, I'm curious, did everybody know that a 2x4 is not actually 2 inches by 4 inches? Due to the milling uh, and planing process, it's planing, not planning. That's wrong. Planing. Due to the planing process for, uh, for structural lumber, um, I can spell. Um, due, to, <laughs> due to the milling and planing process, we rough cut lumber, so like a two by four is rough cut two inches by four inches, and then it is milled and planed a little bit smaller to ensure consistent dimensions. So a two by four is actually one and a half by three and a half inches. Uh, and so from that, we can compute areas, moments of inertia, and so on and so forth. Notice that the moment of inertia for a two by four, because it's just a rectangle, it's the h cubed over 12, okay? Notice how when you flip the axis, what you're doing is flipping the property. So instead of BH cubed over 12 for this axis, it's HB cubed over 12. So you're just flipping the terms. And you will end up getting a much smaller number about one direction than you do the other. That's why, again, moments of inertia are uh, oriented. That's why beams are oriented a certain way in terms of bending. Again, notice the presence of a moment of inertia and this term S, which was in these tables as, uh, as well here, S is what's called a section modulus. We'll talk about that later. It's really easy to compute, but I want to deal with the hard stuff first. Any questions? All right. What we're going to do is we're going to compute the moment of inertia together of this shape. Okay. Now, I like this shape because it's all rectangles, so there's not many formulas to memorize, but it will afford us the opportunity of going through the algorithm. Also, because the section is not symmetric up and down, we got to figure out what the, or where the location of the centroid is. Okay, so we have to do centroid calculations and moment of inertia calculations, and so it will afford us the opportunity of reviewing all of it. I'm going to show you the algorithm that I use to compute moments of inertia. It's very tabular. It's very Excel friendly. Um, it's also um, uh, pretty systematic. It's kind of hard to forget uh, or, or miss stuff, if you will. Now what we're going to be doing is computing the moment of inertia with respect to the horizontal axis. So we're going to be looking at this sort of in an up and down fashion. And what I want to ask you is, after we finish this problem, would it really become more difficult if I took the shape and turned it 90 degrees? The answer is no, but we would get a different answer. I'm going to give you a sec to copy all this down. Take your time. All right, has everybody got this? Okay. All right. Now, a couple things. The first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to compute the location of the centroid. Okay? So, if you remember, when you're doing centroid computations, the first thing that you need to do is you need to establish a common reference data, right? A common axis about which you will express all your distances, right? For example, as we said, the location of the centroid is a weighted average, right? Well, it's a weighted average measured from where? 
Okay? We have to establish a common reference. I like to use the bottom of the cross section. I think it's easier to express your distances from the bottom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a line down here at the bottom. And I'm going to call this my reference datum. And so the point is, the first thing that we are going to need to do is we are going to need to locate wherever the centroid is. Okay, and so whenever we compute y bar, y bar is going to be measured from that datum. Okay, like y bar is meaningless if we don't know where it's measured from. Okay, now I'm going to also introduce some terminology for you. There is an imaginary line that the centroid passes through right here. We have a name for that line in mechanics of materials. We call this the, the neutral axis. And the reason that we call it the neutral axis is because if you bend it about, you know, about that direction, you know, if we say the top, maybe the top's experiencing compression, the bottom's experiencing tension, along the centroid, the stresses are neutral. So. I know, us engineers were creative with our name. What did you say, Mark? Okay. Now, in terms of naming these sections, let's just keep it simple. Let's call this the top flange or TF. Wait. I'm going to call on you for a lot of help with computations. You did not bring your Casio FX115S plus or similar scientific calculator? I couldn't even say it. What am I going to do with you, sir? If you want. What? Uh, back to the exam. Okay. Now. Let's look, at here, let's look here at our dimensions. So we have a plate here on the bottom that is 18 inches wide. That is one and a quarter inches thick. Okay. We have the web, which is 32 by 5 eighths inch thick. And we have the top flange, which is 14 by 3 quarter inches thick. For you civil engineers in the room, what I will mention is that it is not uncommon in bridge applications to have flanges with different sizes. Okay. Because as the bridge is being constructed, the, the beam is experiencing different load events. So, for example, during construction, the beam has to support the weight of the wet concrete by itself. But once the wet the concrete cures and becomes composite with the steel beam, then the deck can carry some of the load. So when the trucks and the vehicles are on the bridge, you actually expect a little bit more out of your bottom flange than you do the top flange. So it's not that uncommon to have differently sized flanges in bridge applications. So random factoid for you. So this isn't outside the realm of, of reality. Okay. Now, does everybody have this schematic drawn? Okay, good, because I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a big table, okay? This table is going to have a lot of columns. It's going to have seven columns. So as you're drawing this on your paper, just be aware that it's going to be kind of wide and it's going to have a lot of columns. You might want to do this on a paper and turn it that way. Whatever works, I'm just telling you that this is going to get kind of big. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to list our three shapes. And our three shapes are the top flange, the web, and the bottom flange. And then on the bottom, when necessary, we are going to sum the columns. We're not going to sum every column, only the ones that are needed. Okay? Like I said, this is going to be a wide table, so just bear with me. Now, the first column is really easy. The first column. We're computing the areas. The 
areas are going to be in square inches. Okay? So, for example, the top flange, what is the area of a rectangle that's 14 inches by 3 quarters of an inch? <clears throat> like I'm making you break out your Casio FX115 ES pluses or similar scientific calculators, right? I'm going to make you do some work this morning. And let's use some decimals on that. What we got? All right. All right, everybody, settle down. We got 10.5 square inches. Do you have a second on that? There we go. All right, the web. We have a web that is 32 inches tall and has a thickness of 5 eighths of an inch. What's the area of that? All right, hold on. In all seriousness, let's stop. Let's let's reduce the chatter a little bit because kind of, I got 52 people in here. It's kind of hard to hear who's saying what. What's the area? 20. 20. Do I have a second on that? Yes. All right. Bottom flange. What do we got? It's 18 by one and a quarter. 22.5. Second on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is a column that we are going to need to sum. So I want you to sum this column, and I want you to tell me what's the sum of these, uh, these areas. Fifty-three. I think I heard seconds on that. Okay. All right. That's simple. Okay. Now, the first thing that we needed to do as you recall, is compute the location of the centroid. Now, the way that we determine the location of the centroid is we take the sum of y times the area divided by the sum of the area. But what are the y distances? Okay, The y distances are the distance from our reference datum to the centroid of each of these individual shapes. Okay? So, how far is it? So we're actually going to start with the bottom flange. How far is it from the bottom, the reference datum, to the centroid of that bottom flange? Inches. 0.625 inches. So it's half the thickness, right? So we're going to say that this is 0 0.625. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this the Y column. We're starting here on the bottom. We're saying 0 0.625. Okay? Now, let's deal with the, uh, the, um, the web. So how do we get to the center, the centroid of the web from the reference datum? Somebody tell me without doing all the math. So, so we're taking this thickness plus half of that. So 16 plus 1 and a quarter, so we're getting 17.25. Right? Okay. Now, all right. Here's the last one. Let's see, how do we do this last one? Let me drag this down a little bit. So how do we get from the datum to the centroid of the top flange? So let's walk this through in our heads. So we go one and a quarter, right? 32 and half that thickness. So what is that? I'll need to speak up whoever said that. Did you bring your Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator? I'm going to call on you for the next one. Now, this is a column we do not sum. We do not mean the sum of those distances. It wouldn't mean anything anyways. Alright, now... We said that we're going to take the sum of 
A times Y divided by the sum of A. So I've got the sum of the areas. I need A times Y. So what we're going to do is we're going to take AY times cubic inches. And this is where it gets systematic. What we do is we take that times that, that times that, that times that, and sum it up. So this gets pretty systematic. So I'll help you out with this first one. So this first one, we take 10 and a half times 33.625. Well, we're going to say 353, we'll say 0 0.063. That's enough. I mean, if we were doing this in Excel, it would track all our decimals anyways, and that's close enough for what we're doing here in this course. All right? So help me out with this next one. What's this middle row going to give you? 345. 345. Do I have a second? All right, and then the last one, 22.5 times 0 0.625. Let me color in these decimals a little bit better. That's probably kind of hard to see. So what do we get for this bottom row? 14.063. Do I have a second on that? Okay, now this column is something I'm going to sum. So... When you sum these up, what do you get? Come on, guys. What we got? 7, 12, and change. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 712.125. All right, 125. Uh, nice. Just a little bit of change. At some point, we do need some precision. Okay, all right, everybody pay attention. So, so I want to I want to make sure that our answers make sense. Okay, so let let's talk about this a little bit. All right, what we're going to do now is we're going to compute y bar. We're going to compute that down here. So, y bar is the sum of AY over the sum of A, which is computed as 712.125, and the units are going to be cubic inches over 53 square inches. And so what do we get for this? Let's do like three decimal places. 13.436. Do I have a second? Okay. Now I can do better than that. That's a little Especially for the folks in the back, that might be kind of thing. 13.436. That's better. Okay. Now I want to I want to think a little bit about this answer. Okay? Now, does everybody have that written down? Okay. Can somebody look at this schematic and tell me something wrong with this schematic? Let me ask it this way. How far is it from the datum to this point right here? Say, so say it again. No, 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 not, not to the neutral axis, to that point right there. 17 and a quarter. 17 and a quarter. So let me ask you again. Is there something wrong with this? What, what's wrong? Are you not adding the, the Y from the bottom part? No, not quite. We're, the centroid of that piece is a lot higher than the center of gravity. I drew this too high, didn't I? This, this neutral axis actually probably needs to be somewhere like down here, right? Does that make sense? Because this distance right here is 17.25 inches. And so we got Y bar to be like 13 something, right? So I put that in the wrong spot. Does that make sense? Okay, there is a reason I'm going on about this. Let me, let me redraw this a little bit more accurately. So, would a more accurate representation be something like this? And then 
Y bars maybe a little bit like that. Is that is that fair? Because Y bar like is that more dimensionally consistent? Everybody okay with that? I, I, I want to make sure everybody's okay with that because I'm, I'm not doing that superfluously. There is a reason I'm doing this. Here's the reason I'm doing this. The bottom flange is bigger, right? The bottom flange is bigger than the top flange. So the centroid of the cross section should hug a little bit closer to the bottom than float towards the top, right? If we had a really, really big top flange and a really tiny bottom flange, then we would expect the centroid to be pretty high, right? The reason I'm having you do this and, and think this through is because I don't want you to be on an exam and go, come on, my goodness. I don't want you to be on an exam and, and be doing a problem and not have a means of gut checking your work, okay? I want you to be able to, be, to look at a problem and go, that centroid makes sense, okay? The centroid is just as was stated earlier. It's a weighted average of the area. There's more area on the bottom of the cross-section than there is on the top. So the centroid should hug a little bit lower. Does that make sense? I, I want you to have that means of doing that computation. Okay. All right. Now, what we're really after to do, what we're really trying to do here, okay, our... Real goal is the sum of I naught plus AD squared. This is the parallel axis theorem. Okay? That's our goal. So for each of these shapes, what do I have? Right now, all I have is the area of each shape. In order to apply this algorithm, the parallel axis theorem, that's what this is called. I'm going to write that down, make sure everybody remembers that. In order to apply that, I need a few things. I need the moment of inertia, and I need the D distances. Let's start with the moment of inertia. Now, when I have a rectangle that's h tall and b wide, what is the moment of inertia again? Bh squared over twelve. Hold on, bh cubed over what? Twelve. Twelve. There we go. So we need to compute bh cubed over 12, okay? But we need to be clear on what we're doing here, okay? In this algorithm, the dimensions are relative to the coordinate system, okay? What that means is, is that b is the width horizontally. h is the height vertically. So for the top flange, which value are we cubing? Are we cubing the 18 or are we cubing the one and a quarter? The one and a quarter. The one and a quarter is the vertical dimension, okay? So when we compute this little I value for the top flange and the bottom flange, it will be small. That's okay, okay? So what this is going to look like is it's going to be 18. Oh, bottom line, sorry. Bottom line. We're doing bottom line first. So we're doing 18 times 1 and a quarter cubed, and all of that divided by 12. So this is going to be a small number. What do we get for the bottom flange? 2.929. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So since you understand that, why don't you go ahead and do the top flange for me. We'll do the web last. Again, the top flange is going to be a small number. Nine, 
0.4918. So that was the second. So we'll do 0 0.492. Now, pay attention. How are we going to do this for the web? We flip it. So which one do we cube? The 30, the 32, right? Because the 30, see, in, in, with the web, the 5 eighths is the B. And the 32 is the height. Think about what we're doing. We're computing the moment of inertia of each rectangle. So for the web, think about the floor joist in the, in the roof deck or in the patio, right? It's acting up, it's oriented vertically. So we should have a high number there. So this is going to be a big number. Like these are decimals or twos. This one's going to be big. 1,706 and two-thirds. All right, so 1,706 point, we'll say 667. Do I have a second on that? That's normal, okay? That, that's not wrong. There's nothing wrong about that. That is, that is honestly correct. So imagine what would happen, okay? Now, before we move on, imagine what would happen if we took our I-beam and did that and computed the moment of inertia this way. We would get big numbers for our flanges, small number for the web, right? Does that make sense? So I, I want you to notice the patterns here. Okay. Now we need the D distances. The D distances are very easy. We take the Y distances minus Y bar. So how do we do that? We take this minus that, this minus that, this minus that. So let's do the first one. What is 33.625 minus this? I know it's going to be positive. 20.189. Do I have a second on that? All right. What about uh, the web? What about the other one? The bottom flange. Okay, negative 12.811. Now, here's the thing. I'm being pretty conscious of my signs, but do they really matter? No, because I'm going to square this distance. So they don't really matter. But let's, let's stop for a sec and let's see, do these answers make sense? Okay, what are the D distances? The D distances are the distance from the centroid of each individual shape to the centroid of the whole thing. So look what we got. For the top flange and the web, we got positive answers. For the bottom flange, we got a negative answer. We went down for the bottom flange. We went up for the top flange and the web. Notice how the distance for the web was tiny because that's all we're just doing that little bit. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, now can we apply the parallel axis theorem? What do we need? We need I naught plus A B squared. I'm going to move this. It's okay. Oops. All right, hold on. Can't do that on a whiteboard. Okay. So now what we're going to do is row by row, we're going to do I plus AD squared. So we're going to take I plus A times that quantity squared. And so we'll say two decimal places on each row because that's, that's good enough. Forty-two eighty point what? Twenty-five. Second. All right. Next row. Forty-two
Do I have a second? Yep. Right, let me, I can do that. I want to make sure everybody can read that. All right, in the last row. And so this column is a column I'm going to sum. And so when you sum these three, what do you get? Uh, 9973.52. 9973.52. Do I have a second? So, I propose that the moment of inertia is 99.73, we'll say 0.5 inches to the fourth. We're going to stop for, I'll talk a little bit, we'll stop for a second, then we're going to be done. We'll, we'll leave a little early today, but I want to make sure everybody understands this, and particularly understands the algorithm. So I have a few things to say. I want to talk a little bit about the data that we uh, uh, arrived at at the end, particularly our outputs on this table. If you ever wanted to know why I-beams are the way they are, if you wanted to know why do we use I-beams, this is why, right here. The idea is to configure a beam such that we get as much steel away from the centroid as possible. So if we take these flat plates and stick them away from the centroid, the centroid being in the middle of the web, we get a really large I plus AB squared generated from each flange. Okay? The reason that we're getting a higher value for the top flange is because the top flange is further away from the centroid than the bottom flange. But that's why I-beams are configured the way that they are. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, a couple of other things that I think worth mentioning. Um, this algorithm and this problem, I think, are harder than your homework assignment. Your homework assignment is going to exhibit symmetry. Okay? So your homework assignment um, is going to have issues where some of the values repeat, some of the values are zero, and so that part's going to be easy. The, um, the tricky part with the homework assignment is ensuring that the dimensions don't overlap. I put a little image on the bottom of the homework assignment that I think will help um, clarify some things, uh, and so I want you to, uh, uh, to, to take that to heart. I have one final thing, and I'll let you go. Um, so when you do the homework assignment, you should get the answer that's in the table, but a little bit less, okay? One final point, this is, again, the hardest value to compute, okay? The other values in that table come from this. So for example, anybody still have this value stored in their calculator? Okay, let me ask you a question, all right? This is the moment of inertia about the x-axis, okay? I want you to do me a favor. Take this and divide it by the area, Fifty-three. All right. Now, whatever you got, give me the square root of that. No, no, no. Well, it's that's that's honestly serendipity. But what'd you get? Thirteen point what? Thirteen point seven. Okay. Let me show you something. All right. What you just did. Um, let me pull pull this up. What you just did is this whole big example was the moment of inertia. That was the radius of gyration. This term R, all you do to compute R is you take I over A and you take the square root. Okay. Basically what R is, is it's kind of like a normalized moment of inertia because moments of inertia come out in inches to the fourth. And so if you take inches to the fourth, divide it by the area, and then take the square root, you get the answer in inches. Okay. R values will become important later because if you take an element and you load it in tension, it elongates. But if you take an element and you load it in compression, it bubbles, right? And so what we'll find later near the end of the semester is that buckling 
is a function of slenderness. The more slender an element is, the more apt it is to buckle. And slenderness is measured as L, the length, over R. R is the radius of gyration. The section modulus, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, is just the moment of inertia divided by the centroidal distance. So, but that's more of a bending stress thing that we'll talk about next week. Again, if you know, if you can do the moment of inertia, if you can compute that, if you can do that work, everything else is usually pretty straightforward. That, this is the hard part, okay? And I guarantee you, I really think this example is harder than the one that you're going to get on your homework assignment. Now, what we're going to do, one, one final thing. What we're going to do on Thursday is another review from statics. And that review from statics is shear and moment diagrams. And so, if you have a straight edge, bring it on Thursday. It will help you in your uh, exam uh, example conversation. That is all. I will see you all on Thursday.